Hello, Looney listeners. This is episode five of Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. I'm one of your sleepless hosts, Ray. And I'm one of your eyelidless hosts, Connor. This week, <laughs> we have speculation of a possible Punisher Netflix appearance. Issue 5 of Lemire Smallwood Belair, and Belair's most recent run, Morpheus' character profile, and a review of his first appearance in Moon Knight, Volume 1, Issue 12. So grab out your issues, sit back, relax, and get your conch on. Connor, we, um, we had a bit of news that came right after we kind of literally finished our mm. previous episode. We, uh, we had a lot of information last episode, episode four, which was so much fun to go through. But um, yeah, there was, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, there was another new bit of news that kind of sprung up um, about the Punisher TV show. Yeah, and I'm kind of glad it didn't come last week because that was a big week. But yes, uh, during a was it, Marvel presentation at a Asia Pop Comic Con in mm-hmm. Manila, is that how you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah in the Philippines. Pronunciations. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, Senior Vice President um, of Creator and Content Develop announced another Marvel hero may be showing up in The Punisher. Mm. And look, it wasn't totally kind of revealed that it was Moon Knight but it was a lot of speculation so uh, this kind of got all the Moon Knight fans a buzz oh yeah uh, and um, and it kind of look it kind of makes sense that um, that Moon Knight would appear um, looking at the, the possibilities look number one uh, Karen Page is already in the show that's you know without a doubt so there's always the connection with Daredevil popping up somewhere and the fact that uh, but the Punisher has been in Daredevil season two. I mean, so that kind of makes sense. Um, also, weighing up against that is the fact that um, the events of of the Defenders has Daredevil spoilers anyone uh, mm. out of out of commission. So, uh, you know, um, you can kind of I don't know go either way on that one. Um, and what was the other one they kind of... Um, people were saying probably Iron Fist. Yeah, because um, while Daredevil's now out of commission, um, it's sort of revealed at the end of The Defenders that he's sort of becoming the protector of Hell's Kitchen like uh, mm-hmm. he did around the Civil War period when he actually wore the costume. Yep, so, I mean, that's definitely... We can definitely see Finn Jones uh, popping up and, and uh, crossing paths with uh, Frank Castle. But uh, the... The best bit of speculation I guess we were looking at was that there's that obvious military tie Mm. um, between Frank Castle and one Mark Spector, a mercenary. So um, I'm not sure, Connie, have you seen the the teaser trailer? for? Yeah, that was uh, very military focused, wasn't it? And that seems to be um, like we now have the um, episode titles released in Morse code on Twitter, which is pretty funny. Yeah, even more more so. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that, that was very sort of all military focused. So I think... I think, yeah, that's a, that's a rather good possibility. I think um, my main thing is, from what we've heard about the Punisher and sort of Netflix in general, is it sounds that this Punisher series does sort of want to establish it by himself. I think these showrunners really want mm-hmm. um, Frank Castle to have his own legs outside of the Defenders and Daredevil. So I really do think that it's actually much lower on the scale to see Iron Fist and... I don't think we'll see Daredevil considering he's fairly out of commission. So mm. yeah, I def- I'm definitely thinking a new Marvel hero. We got Moon Knight, and the only other sort of speculation that could work would be Nighthawk. But I think that'd be crazy to. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be crazy not to give us Moon Knight though. I think I think fans are banging at the doors for it. Mm, yeah, Moon Knight versus Night Nighthawk is great. Look, I, I've enjoyed oh, yeah. the um, I enjoyed the David F. Walker run, but too short, could... sadly. Too short, like six issues or something. Mm. But if you um, put them side by side, um, Nighthawk's kind of like a, a C-list character compared to to Moon Knight. I mean, Moon Knight isn't exactly A-list, but you know he's a bit higher than the Nighthawk. Nighthawk, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I totally agree as well. I think they are when they were talking about the Punisher show, um, they were making an effort to say how how standalone it was mm-hmm. against the Defenders and how like this is a totally different show because. Um, it's got a guy basically essentially without any powers. And if you look at Moon Knight, 
Um, he, I mean, literally, you could say the same thing as well. He, he doesn't really have any powers apart from that Volume 2 run. Um, and Which everyone got... seems to want to forget. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, yeah, if you ask me, I yeah, I'd like to see it as just like a separate <laughs> <laughs> reality or something. But yeah, true. Also, um, being bitten by the werewolf as well. That was only very brief in his early run. But apart from all that, he's really just essentially a guy running around in a costume with with weird gadgets. So he would be a good fit. Um, and yeah, I definitely see uh, the Punisher being set apart from the other other defenders. Um, I mean, I don't know. I can't even imagine the pun- Punisher up against the hand. It just seems a bit too crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think they'd go that route. And I think, mm. I think the, the fact is demand so there. You kind of don't want to sort of crush expectations with, you know, how lofty Marvel Netflix is at the moment. Mm. Yeah, it's... Um... You know, they're definitely doing really good stuff with their oh. with their shows. You know, despite what some people say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I, I really enjoyed the Defenders. And I really enjoyed Iron Fist as well, uh, as well as all the others. Um, so I think they're doing very well at the moment. Um, just one of the other points that did come out. There was a, a second like when this interview, well, not interview, when this article hit. Uh, there were a few other identical articles as well, but there was one other one which um, kind of added a bit more fuel to the fire. Um, by having they, I think they announced that um, Shori Agdashlu um, has recently joined the Punisher cast, and she plays a, a psychiatrist. So, if you again look at Moon Knight, um, there's there might be a tie there with uh, his mental condition, and there being a psychiatrist uh, in the Punisher show. I mean, you can also argue the fact that. The Punisher pretty much needs a psychiatrist as well, <laughs> right? So uh, we might be clutching at straws there, but uh, it is good to speculate on. Yeah, well, there's. Um, I think we'll know whenever we get name confirmation because uh, the Ellis Wood Bun Run had a fairly prominent psychiatrist in that. That mm. you know, some some deadly plot te- details turned out to happen with her. So That's know, if, if we see a name, then we we might actually have confirmation. There was that. Is it, well, I mean, he's had a couple of psychiatrists, but there was the one in a that a civil war issue as well of the Houston run. Oh yes, the uh, one of the ones that we featured on the reading list. Yeah. Uh, that that Moon Knight uh, kind of tricked into getting registered. <laughs> uh, so there's definitely a lot of a lot of psychiatrists uh, along Moon Knight's way. So um, speculation abounds with the psychiatrist on the Punisher show. Um, the other article, I guess, Connor, that we we came across um, was. <laughs> I guess adding on to this that, you know, oh, Moon Knight might be featuring finally on screen somehow. Um, there was another article, I I can't remember who it was by, but they uh, speculated... Comicbook.com. Comicbook.com, okay. Um, and they had a list of five actors who could portray Moon Knight in Netflix. Now, we've kind of, we've kind of had this little game um, happen or pop up every now and again as well as to, you know, who you'd like to fan cast um, in Moon Knight. Uh... I know on our group page uh, a while ago we had a little uh, fan casting thing for Marlene and Crawley and Frenchie, but uh, they have five actors listed here, Connor, for for Moon Knight. Yeah, well, actually a lot of uh, probably a lot of orphan black actors in here, which is my uh, yeah. favourite part. But uh, yeah, <laughs> the first one they suggested was uh, Dylan Bryce. Uh, yeah, what, what, I only know what from you... orphan, ba- orphan black. Mm. And what, what? How do you see him being a uh, fit into Moon Knight or Mark Spector? Um, uh, it'd be interesting to see him take a different role, but I think this, I think he captures the uh, the Stephen Grant personality really well. But I'm not so sure about uh, the Jake Lockley and Mark Spector side of things. Actually, I'm a bigger fan of the um, next on the list, the uh, mm-hmm. Michelle oh, Houseman. Houseman. Yeah, Houseman. yeah. Mm-hmm. He's a he's a Dutch actor, um, uh, and he's he featured yeah, Orphan Black and on Game of Thrones as well. Um, yeah, just just um, Houseman I think would be he's got he's got a bit more of a rugged look, um, mm. so I could see him both as Jake Lockley and uh, and uh, Mark Spector. Basically. Yeah, he kind of has like that mix of sort of charming and ruggedness. Mm, what about you? Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dylan Bryce. I can't. Um, yeah, I can see the Stephen Grant, in him, and maybe mm. the maybe the Mark Spector. I, I 
I did watch Orphan Black, but it's been a while ago now. Wasn't he like a an, an undercover operative or something there as well? Yeah, he was. Uh, he was working for that uh, the male clone sort of company yeah. in season three or whatever. Okay, so I kind of perceive him as a little bit of a like a Mark Spector as well. Yeah. But I, I I can't see him as a as a Jake Lockley to be honest. Yeah, um, no, he doesn't. That's what I very much like about the sort of suave and ruggedness of um. Who's name? Uh, oh yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think with Mark Spector or you know Moon Knight as a whole, I think, um, although he's got to act as Stephen Grant, he really has to have that kind of rough, uh, not as beaten up look as Frank Castle, but um, he, he, I don't see him as a pretty boy by any any means. No. Nah. Although, hmm, although like he is kind of drawn sometimes and um, a, as kind of you really dapper kind of guy and, and, and that's the guy Stephen Grant um, is the guy who Marlene really has fallen in love with but uh, yeah Mark Spector on a whole I think is is he's got to be a bit more rugged so um, yeah so how about the third one the third one they've got listed is Josh Dallas from um, from Once I think is, is that, that Once like Upon a f- Time Once Upon a Time that fairy tale kind of TV show right yeah yeah and that's we were just talking about like uh sort of Mark Spector not being a pretty boy and he kind of fits a bit too much in the role like from what I've seen of course he's a good actor he'll fit the mm. role but from everything I've seen him in Once Upon a Time Thor yeah. he's definitely Thor, played yeah. the pretty boy character and he, and he was like uh, was he Fandral in um in Thor um, one of the um the, one of the one of Thor's mates uh, he got replaced by uh, <laughs> Zachary Levy I think um, yeah I don't really remember him at all yeah, well, it, I, I think he was Fandral, and if, if he was, Fandral was kind of like your Robin Hood dashing sort of fellow, so, yeah, again, not not really a good fit for Mark Spector, I don't think, um, m- maybe in a few years, I don't know, he kind of looks <laughs> kind of too fresh-faced. Um, the next one is an interesting choice, uh, what did you think of J.R. Ramirez? I haven't seen him in anything, I... I... I like the look of him, actually. I think he could be a... I, th- I think in the... Depending on what he's been in, I think I could actually trust him as a Moon Knight, but it's just sort of the problem. I don't know what he's been in. Mm. Well, yeah, he's, got, he's been listed in, like, two shows which I don't follow, which is Powers, I think, and, and, uh, and Arrow. Uh, he's got a bit, to me, from that photo on the article, he's got a bit of a uh, Colin Farrell look, you know, although uh, a bit more of a... Uh, South American kind of background, or Latino background, um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. I think I just don't know too much about him. I don't know, um, you know, how he w- what his roles are and how how he acts. Um, uh, look wise, look, he can pull it off. I think he, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any problem with that. But um, yeah, I think he's kind of in the same boat with Josh Dallas for me. Pretty much like a a, a bit of a stretch. Yeah, he's apparently appearing in Jessica Jones Season 2, so I guess when that drops, oh. we can report back to you on his acting ability. <laughs> ah, well, if he's in Jessica Jones Season 2, then he can kind of rule it. Ooh, unless, <laughs> unless it's Moon Knight. <laughs> in, in, Ooh. Uh, no, in, 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 <laughs> according to this, he's playing someone named Oscar. Ah, so I sadly okay. don't think so. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> well, unless he does a... Um, uh, oh, what's the name? A... Um, you know how you have some of the couple of actors in in uh, Marvel that have played two roles, unless he does that. Um, oh yeah, roll. it was um, first he played. Oh look, I don't forget the um main woman in yeah, uh, but, Luke Cage. But she was, yeah, she was Black Mariah, but I can't remember um yeah her her, her real name. But anyway, yeah, I look, I <laughs> yeah, I doubt then he'll he'll actually make the cut for for Moon Knight. Uh, how about the last one? The last one is the most interesting one, and I um I had a little uh. Uh, a little chat with Paul on the Into oh. the Night um, group and uh, yeah I agree with him actually Paul was saying that he could see Ryan Eggold um, as as Mark Spector what do you what are your thoughts no I definitely agree he has, um, mm. he sort of fits that same thing as um, who's name yep um, yeah uh, he's sort of like from the roles I've seen him in he's, he's I've sort of seen him play a very sort of dark and serious Casper character and mix it up with a, a much lighter tone so mm-hmm. yeah no I, I, I think I think he can play well he's been in the blacklist um, 
Or is that what else he was in? Is yeah, that he, where you saw him? Yeah, he played um, Tom Keane was the husband of the main character, and he played a very interesting and well acted role in that oh, show. Oh, cool. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen it, but I did jump onto IMDb, and uh, and Paul posted up a few um a few photos of him, and yeah, he definitely looks the the, the part. I mean, mainly because he was beaten up in in a lot of the photos, so you know he's got those you know the, the band aids and and the scars on his face. I, I don't know, so he kind of looked like it. Um, like Mark Spector, but also as well um, in the blacklist, he's, he's what he's played against um, James Spader, who's who's Ultron in, yeah. in uh, Age of Ultron. So there's a bit of a Marvel connection there. So you never know whether <laughs> that will help him or not. But yeah, Dad, definitely Ryan Eggold. I, I, anyone else that you can think of, or who you'd like to see fan cast um, as, as Moon Knight? Ooh. Since we're there, um, I think uh, Rick in um, the group recommended Michael. C C Hall, which I think oh, an interesting from De- choice. I think yeah. From from Dexter. Dexter. Yeah, he'd be interesting as well. He was um a lot of people wanted him to be Daredevil. There was a lot of talk oh. before yeah, before the casting of um of Charlie Cox. Um there was, you know, fan casting of who you'd want to see as Daredevil. A lot of people tagged him. I, I guess mostly he's got the red hair as well. Um but uh, he's got the acting chops, I take it, from Dexter. Yeah, um, I mean, everyone kind of wants to see um, Jake Yellenhall as well, which would yeah, be yeah. amazing. I think he's an incredible mm, actor. He, yeah, he'd be the number one pick, I think. Um, but then again, I, I'd, li- I'd like to see him play him, but he'd be more suited, unless he goes into TV. I, I just see him as a cinematic actor, yeah. right? I don't think he's he'd play, unless they give him a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> to, to go back to TV. Uh, yeah, he, he's, got the, he's got the good look for it, I think. Yeah. Um, who else was I? Th- I was thinking. I always come back to this guy. The uh, he played Oberon in Game of Thrones. He was um, uh, he was the guy in Game of Thrones that um fought the the mountain. You know oh, that guy. Yeah. That, and he ended up it was a horrible death. <laughs> it was one <laughs> of the most shock. Do you remember that one? Yeah. No. Um. Pedro Pascal. Yeah, that guy. I reckon he'd look. I, think, mm. I reckon he'd be pretty good. Um, he could either play Mark Spector or, or get him on onto his Frenchie. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't just put a put a moustache on him. I reckon he'd be um, he'd be well suited for the role. Yeah, but uh, gotta come back and do a bit of a fan casting for the rest of the cast. No one seems to want to give Frenchie mm. or Marlene the the fan cast. Yeah, I reckon we should. Um, we should put up a poll again on our on our group uh, and and put it out to the uh, the oh, fans yeah. out there who who you like to see. Uh, we yeah, like I said, I might even dig up the old ones and I had some photos happening there. But uh, it would be really interesting to see. Uh, oh, I'd love to see Marlene on screen and and Crawley on screen, even Gina as well. Gina would be interesting. Um, you know, at her diner with her two sons. Yeah, um, that'll be I think very important to the Netflix sort of street level. Hmm. And actually, also as well, just thinking, um, you posted, Connor, I think, up onto the group as well. There was an IMDB thing, um, which came up late in the in the week. Uh, it was it was titled Moon Knight, um, and the year was 2022. Uh, and do you remember that one? <laughs> yeah, it was a really, yeah. it, it was a really strange fan cast of a bunch of, like, I, I, it was definitely sort of a fan cast of an actual movie in the, um, you know, alongside the big mm. guns in the MCU, and it had a lot of really sort of strange roles, and I think this person's sort of own um, original characters, but mm. it had um, two interesting bits I really, I really liked. Um, one was actually Dave Franco was a possible Mark Spector. Yeah. And Gwendolyn Christie as Conchu, which seems strange, but when I thought about it, I actually kind of fell in love with the idea. Yeah, that'd be very interesting. Um, I, I thought exactly the same as well. That was a, the standout for me. Uh, it wasn't so much Franco, although he's kind of got the look as well. Yeah. But I was way more interested in Christie being Conchu. That would be just... Um, that'd be weird. And and I do know her from Game of Thrones, and, and she's fantastic in it. So um, that would be a really cool choice, I think. Yeah, because it's really just sort of a... Uh, in a suit with a massive bird head, so mm. you know. I, 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 they'd have to keep the bird head. I think I'd love to see the bird oh, head yeah. on the screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, they can't lose that. But yeah, Gwendolyn Christie, even if even if it's her own voice, and you know, and her face pops up every now and again, that would be really cool. Mm. Um, but a very interesting. Like, can anyone post 
things up on IMDb. I found it quite. Yeah, strange. anyone can, and they'll instantly ah. sort of write up something if it's a rumor, even if it doesn't have confirmation. And so, yeah, IMDb isn't always your most trustworthy source. Ah. It can be. Yeah. yeah. That's a. Yeah, if it's. I mean, like the write up was a bit, a bit hard to follow as well. I thought. Um. So I think it was a. Whoever posted it up was, you know kind of quickly put it up so uh, there's, there's not much um, credibility to it but uh, hey look it's a bit of a fun read I guess and uh, and the writer as well wanted it connected to Doctor Strange I believe yeah he wanted Scott Derrickson to direct it and uh, I think there was a, a cameo there by Benedict Cumberbatch as well so tying in the um, the mystical with with Moon Knight I think was that fan's wish yeah so it's kind of been a we kind of have if true, possibly uh, big news this week. It's been an uh, interesting one with, uh, oh, you, with Punisher, yeah. yeah. Oh, you reckon, you reckon it'll be this week? Oh, no, I was just saying, sort of like this week in general has been an interesting ride up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, no, yeah, definitely, definitely. We'll have to find out soon, though, you know, may not be this week, but it's, what, a whole, really two months away now we're looking at November for a Punisher show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they haven't really given a um, a direct, a, a definite date, right? But we know it's November. Yeah. But they're, st- they're still kind of holding those cards close to their chest as to the actual release date. So, um, typically, if we work backwards, November, we start getting the main trailer, what, a couple of weeks before release? Yeah. So, so we're, we're looking at um, mid-October to, to get something. Um, but, obviously, before that, we might get a... a Bit, bit more information onto the cast and uh, it maybe even some set photos stuff like that so um, yeah so exciting times uh, I mean I can't wait for the Punisher as well um, uh, although you know I'd like to see some reference to Moon Knight um, oh, yeah. I'll be enjoying these 13 episodes right? Yes. Uh, he, yeah 13 episodes of the Punisher so that would be pretty good um, apart from that, Connor, there was uh, there's not much else. I I know news wise, <laughs> you also posted something on the onto the group about a, uh, yeah. a rabbit. Yeah, yeah, quite possibly <laughs> the best news we've had all year <laughs> is that a a rabbit up for adoption in um, oh, where is it? I think New York. Yeah. Is a is a little rabbit called Moon Knight. That's fantastic. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Our 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 Moon's Knight of Vengeance is <laughs> is a is a little rabbit somewhere. With a with a wiggly nose. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, you'll you'll get to know loonies and listeners as well that um, Connor and I and and uh, our our third host Rebecca um, is uh, are very much animal lovers. So anything to do with animals is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving right along, yeah. we have um, we have our book reviews. Yeah, we're moving straight on. That's a, a nice bit of news, but now it's now it's time for the big guns. <gasps> and as always, uh, we've got two books to review um, today in this episode. Uh, and as always, we'll introduce each of the reviews with a bare bones, which is basically a summation of the story. Uh, then Connor and I will each have our four main aspects um, to the story. What we found were were kind of major points in the story um, for discussion, and then we'll finally rate it with our Crescent Dart ratings. So, um, a first cab off the rank is actually the final part to the first arc that we've been um, we've been covering over the last eps- few episodes. It's uh, Moon Knight, Volume Eight, Issue Number Five. It's uh, titled Welcome to New Egypt, Part 5 of 5. It was released the 3rd of August, 2016, and it has a slightly different uh, creative team with uh, regulars Jeff Lemire on writing, uh, Greg Smallwood on pencils, and Geordie Belair on colours. But this uh, issue has, excitingly enough, um, guest artists, artists uh, James Stoko, Wilfredo Torres, and Francesco Francovia. So this was a visual treat for any comic book reader. Um, The bare bones for issue number five is as follows. Stopped at the entrance to the mysterious pyramid by what appears to be himself, Mr. Knight attacks the classic costumed Moon Knight after Marlene is coaxed to follow the mysterious imposter. 
Mr. Knight manages to stab Moon Knight, but is quickly countered, and Mr. Knight can't help, as Marlene is whisked away. Mr. Knight follows the trail of blood, but what follows is not what he expects at all. Deep in the pyramid, Mr. Knight arrives at a tomb door, where the trail stops, but as he enters, his world changes. Finding himself no longer Mr. Knight, and in the pyramid, but in fact on the moon, Mark Spector has to immediately escape from the sounds of growls and space wolves, which lead him through another doorway. Beyond this, he comes out the other side as Stephen Grant, and now on set of some production, with Marlene surprisingly there to greet him. The reunion is short-lived, however, as the familiar faces of Billy and Bobby, the hospital wardens, attack Stephen, forcing him through yet another door. Again, his world is upended, and we now see Jake Lockley on the seedy streets of New York, late night no doubt, and in a far less salubrious part of town. Despite the different world, Billy and Bobby pop up again to cause grief, but Jake manages to elude them once again via a third doorway. Reality returns to Mr. Knight, and he is once again confronted by the classic Moon Knight visage and the creature underneath the mask. It is Conchu, and the deity's plan of wanting to possess Mark, both mentally and physically, are revealed. Mark, Mark Spector refuses, and to escape, it looks as though he would prefer death over submission. He flees out of the pyramid and willfully leaps to his death, after which there is only darkness. Mark finds himself abruptly awake and as Stephen Grant in a bed. Marlene is there to wish him a good morning, and as Stephen Grant looks over the New York skyline, he can't help but shed a tear of joy at what he finally considers for himself some sort of inner peace. So that was issue five. Um, uh, first thoughts, Connor, what did you reckon? Uh, shocking, crazy, and incredibly well-placed paced with all these incredible artists it was a real oh, i remember when first reading this and just being hit each time with the new art I, I thought it was just groundbreaking actually i'm sure it would have been done before but i really really enjoyed this um yeah. so yeah i mean so um what would be one of your four main aspects Connor? well i think probably the big sort of turning point outside of the three whole different re new realities and uh, well, possibly my favourite part of the run to come is a, a, a sinister reveal with Konshu, um, mm -hmm. with uh, Konshu being in the uh, other the other Moon Knight sort of suit, not so much his personality. And it seems that uh, Mark has just been a pawn really for him trying to get out of the other void. You know, he's enchained Seth, and who mm -hmm. knows what's involved with the um, asylum, the mental hospital. But yeah, it all seems this has been one big ploy for Konshu to be able to enter Mark's body and escape the other other void and become one with our real world. Hmm, did, did you, um, yeah, so, so when you got the, when you saw the big reveal, like, were you, were you shocked or were you, like, was that like a big reveal for you? Because for me, like, as well, it was one of my aspects as well, um, the reveal of Conchu, which is an important thing, but it was really weird because I remember when I first read it, I wasn't totally shocked at, at, <laughs> at it at all. It was kind of like, well, yeah, I, I, I would have pegged Conchu as, as the main guy behind it all anyway. You know what I mean? I mean, although he was kind of, in issues one, two, and three, he, he was kind of uh, guiding Mark. Um, I guess it's because you have these, um, these uh, opinions of him beforehand anyway having mm. having read the earlier series you, you know that you can't trust him or you know that there's always some sort of sinister or, or um ulterior motive to what he does so when it was revealed at the end that it was conchu i was kind of like oh yeah of, of, yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> like yeah i wasn't so i wouldn't say it was disappointing but uh, it, it i don't think it had the um the bang for your buck that it was meant to for when I Ooh. when I read it. Interesting. Um, yeah, but I I, I do like that because you know how we how uh, at the beginning of this issue and beforehand it's it's a classic Moon Knight right and and yeah. we discussed yeah in the in the previous episode oh you know who is this guy he uh, you know this is Moon Knight versus Moon Knight you know is this another part of Mark is it his uh, personality 
and then for it to be Konshu, uh, yeah, I, I um, yeah, I just, I don't know, I, th I thought it was a, a little bit obvious, perhaps, um, but, you know, still a, still a very, I think, still a very good point, and um, what we do get out of it, though, is, yeah, what, what I was asking was, um, and as you mentioned, Seth, was that what has Konshu kind of done, right, you know, what I, you know, he, he, he's kind of, uh, beaten up and, and left Seth there and he's taken over and so what I was thinking was that okay so the pyramid and the jackals and the sand in New York City that's still that stuff still is Seth right but it's just that it's just that um Conchu has taken it over is that yeah. is that what you thought or? yeah well uh, I, I did find the reveal of him actually being in the Moon Knight suits disappointing I, I was hoping mm. it was two different entities but yeah, I mean, I knew Concho always had a second plan, but I really, when I first read this, and I saw it, and then it almost seems like they're heading into a holy war, and um, uh -huh. Mark was going to be sort of his main warrior, so when it was revealed that Concho had no plans of fighting a war, but just mm. he seemed to already have won his domain, and he sort of has control of Mark, I, I, was, I actually found that really interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and he wants to, um, he kind of, I think he mentions that uh, he needs Mark. He basically wants to possess him, right? Because yeah, I think he's uh, he's losing his hold on, I guess, whatever. Well, that's a thing with the other void, right? And the other void, he he's he's losing his vessel, so he kind of wants Mark um, a bit more completely, I guess. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, no, it was a it was a it was a good point, I think. Um, I'm just flicking through to where we see. I do like the um, look. I'll tie this into my uh, one of my main aspects and uh, what I wanted to talk about as well. If we look at the reveal of um, of Conchu, so it's kind of on page fourteen and fifteen uh, when he takes off the mask. What I really found interesting was um, okay. I'll go into the the, the layouts. I thought the layouts to this issue was were really good, um, and each artist. Um, was very distinct so it wasn't only the visuals like the art mm. art style mm. itself but I, I really enjoyed the, the panel layouts so what I gleaned from um, the reveal of of Conchu if you look at that page uh, the panels go from a full panel across the whole page and you see the classic Moon Knight sitting on the throne with a bit of blood and then you see the the panels gradually get smaller and smaller and uh, as they get smaller as well it kind of closes in on um, on on the figures, so the second last has basically the, the head of of the classic Moon Knight, and the last one has a real close up of Mark mm -hmm. Spector's eye, and I like how the panel. So what Greg Smallwood has done is is really kind of um, concentrated and focused it by by reducing the panel size, but not only that, as again you can see as you turn the page and he's um and you get still there's a lot of jagged paneling and and a lot of greg smallwood's art in this yeah. issue has disjointed and fractured panels and what i associate that with is that um mark doesn't is not sure what's going on like he's still kind of a bit um a bit up in the air as to as to what's happening so that's kind of reflected in the layouts and then as you turn the page and as Konshu um uh, explains stuff to Mark, you see the panels are more uh, regulated and they're a lot more solid so he's starting to get an understanding and um, I don't think this is an accident by Smallwood as well so he's he's kind of laid these out so there's some sort of stability there so previously where where Mark was wondering what the hell is going on the panels are very chaotic whereas now they're, they're a bit more um, there's a bit more order to them uh, and as you can see, as he goes, uh, you know, he jumps off the pyramid, and then and then he goes and lands. Um, you get gorgeous very solid, page. very gorgeous page. You get just a very very solid layouts. So all that in mind, if we if we flick back through the different artists, I wanted to just um, I thought was really great about this. If we go first to James Stoko, um, as Mark goes through. Mr. Knight goes through the first tomb. As you can see, that page there, he walks through following the blood. It's all very disjointed, right? Because he doesn't know what's happening. Mm. He's kind of following. As he goes to the next page, which opens up with him basically on the moon, 
Um, James Stokoe's only got two two pages, right? He's only got yeah. two pages to do his stuff. So you, you get a gorgeous half of the page is, is a full spread of him opening, opening up in the moon to kind of show the vastness of where he is. And then the panels are very... Um, are very regular. So he, he, he's got, you know, he's, he's walking towards this door um, and then you basically get very straightforward panels of, uh, of, of the, the wolves chasing him and then before you know it, he's through the door. Then if you look at um, Wilfredo Torres' next as he comes out as Stephen Grant, um, you, you again, again, you get very solid um, panels. So, a, a, and again, uh, a nice big... Uh, you know, juicy panel there to show Marlene and, and, and Stephen Grant. So it's all very kind of, it's kind of very standard there. Um, and then finally, if you look at Francesco Francovillas, uh, what I find interesting as well is that apart from the gorgeous colours that he's got, um, I just love this art because it's very, uh, it's very evocative of a particular age. <laughs> um, you've got, like, if you, you look at the three pages that he has, Connor, he's got like your, he's got your typical full panels, but he's got like a, a round panel and as you move across that that um, that circular panel bounces around the page, um, so it's quite playful. Um, uh, so the first the first page of Franco Villa's art it's on the on the right and it shows a close up of the door. Uh, then it, it goes up uh, and it shows a close up of Jake Lockley getting grabbed by uh, Billy I think or Bobby, um, <laughs> and then. Um, the last one you see it's down at the bottom left where he actually clicks the button to open the door so um, yeah so so very different uses of, of layout I think um, but I found it very clever how um, how they incorporate it in, into each of their, their characters or personalities yeah well that was um, my main two aspects was sort of uh, both Lemire's um, story beats and then the artistic pay- pacing so when you brought up before about Smallwood's um, sort of disjointed art, I really love when you look at it, it's actually like puzzle pieces. Mm. There's a lot of sort of corners missing of different parts. It sort of is very disjointed as he um, moves around the tomb and then by the end when he meets Concha, it's very sort of clicked in and very yes simple like lines of six. Mm-hmm. Well, two lines of three. Oops. And then I think I love when we're moving to the art, just sort of... Just, oh, just the way the story moves. So he's had this big fight at the start, and as he moves through the first door, that big vastness of space has no sound, but a speech bubble, and it's the ah, moon. It's very quiet. So you know you've just gone through this big fight, and the first thing it does, you can almost like hear the silence as you hit that page, and there's just nothing as he stands outside the door. Ah, very good. Yeah, definitely. And then, and yeah, and then it gets so frantic again with the space walls, and then the door closes, and once again it's a moment of peace mm-hmm. before we move to the next page of um, Torres' art, Torres's art that uh, leads him running into the Frank of Ear, which is very playful, but I'd also say very frantic. Mm-hmm. You know, he opens on the page with the sound, but immediately it moves to a fight between um, Lockley, Bobby, and Billy that's very, like, moves, you can just tell very fast across the screen until yeah. we hit the final revelation which is another sort of open and it's a the speech bubble goes like stop question mark because he's back in the tomb as Mr. Knight and it, yeah. just, it just flows so well you know we always talk about how these Lemire issues go so fast it's just because mm. it, it, there's just the way Lemire works with artists there's always just such a clear flow of narr- narrative that you don't you know you can stop and admire every single panel but at the same time, you gain everything just by the way the creative team has worked together to set it up for you. Yeah, mind blowing. It, it is. A, it's it's fantastic, and and it goes back to I guess that question we were pondering about um, the direction that Lemire has for his artists, like how much direction, because it it looks very solid and and very consistent. So you'd you'd have to think that Lemire has really specific instructions for his his artists to um to to, to kind of follow. Uh, just going back to the Francesco Francovilla as well, I totally agree with you about there being a, a franticness to it because mm. if you look at it, it's just um, there's an overstimulation of like, there's a lot yes, happening, you know. Totally. There's different colours. There's there's uh, smoke or steam coming off there. There are bright lights. There are signage everywhere. Um, so yeah, there, definitely there's a, there's a sense of just you know this is in a seedy part of of New York and it's just a buzz with everything. And then you got the uh, 
uh, the lady there as well, trying to solicit something from <laughs> from yeah. Mark. Uh, from Jake, um, but you're right, and then and then the action just picks up. Um, uh, Billy and Bobby, there's just constant movement there, and then with the syringe. So that was a great point, and I, I loved actually what you were saying about James Stokoe's. Uh, there is there is definitely a sense of silence, isn't there, in that first page, as he opens and goes through that door, um, and he's on the moon. It's just very. It kind of adds to it. Not not only the vastness of him being on the moon, and there just being predominantly black like space. Um, but yeah, the the minimal um, the minimal dialogue uh, really gets to it, and then contrasted to when the space wolves come, yeah. you can see their bubbles are all jagged and they fill up a so lot of the cluttered. page. Yeah. So uh, yeah, great points there, Connor. Far out. Now, what what about your next aspect then? While I took up my bit of uh, two aspects. <laughs> no worries. Um, my other one of the main the other main ones. Um, is more towards the end of it, and it's uh, it's when Mark kind of releases himself from Conshu. So he decides, you know, I'm not going to be controlled by this this thing anymore, um, and it just shows, like, how desperate he is to to kind of get away from him. That he would actually basically kill himself, yeah. <laughs> than than to rather rather than be controlled by this guy. So Conshu has obviously had a a massive impact on Mark's life. Well. You could argue that it, it gave him life um, after he was left in the desert, um, and there has been so much of a dependency on Conchu. Again, if we look at the older volumes, Connor of um, we covered uh, or, we, or we discussed actually in the group uh, Midnight Man, and yeah. um, and when the statue was broken, it actually gave Mark a, a mental breakdown as well because he kind of relied so much on Conchu. Um, what was interesting here was that yeah, he Lemire wants Mark to just be. Well, the way Lemire writes Mark is that he just wants him to be free of Conchu. It's almost like a curse. So I found it very, um, very poignant uh, and and quite um, and quite powerful how he he runs away from Conchu, leaps off the the pyramid, and as wow. you see him, oh, yeah. mm, and as you see him kind of falling down, he's reminiscing. And there's a great little bit of artwork by Smallwood again with uh, another style of him just with his friends. Um, so you've got Crawley, Frenchie, Marlene and Gina just having a good time. So it was quite it was quite sad in that respect. And then the next page, uh, hit him just, yeah, just dead, um, lying down and then consumed by the sandstorm. I thought that was a, a very powerful um, way to to end, um, you mm. know, in, in apostrophes the the story. Uh, yeah, but it was a uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, and I sort of love that. That's actually a great way, you know. This one is, you know, a lot of people recommend this as an introduction, but it's so worthwhile for long time Moon Knight readers because you know you don't need an explanation of Mark monologuing about how Conchu has ruled his life. It's just mm. a the a yes and then the look of emotion on his face when he says no and just jumps you know there's no monologue you, you know this as a as a character you know what he's been through yeah and you, you kind of feel for him as well so much um so it was it was quite sad um i thought yeah that point um how about your third point connor um aspect yeah well that was um i sort of combined the two with the artistic end story pacing and, and yeah mm -hmm. well my last one then was just this ending and you know you get to the page where he's dead in the sand his head's cracked open there's blood and he's just swept away and i thought you know that's the end and then the mm -hmm. big reveal at the end that he wakes up as stephen grant with uh marlene and the torres uh yep yeah that that was my final aspect as well and i think it was a nice little clever clever way to end it or um as an epilogue uh well actually no it would be an end because uh, it would be the ending um you wouldn't consider mark dying as the end because uh yeah this being the final aspect i, I thought this was really great um it, it kind of s still left you a little wondering as yeah. to what's happening although at the same i don't know weird to say but at the same time there was a sense of closure to it like that last page when mark um opens the blinds and he's actually he's silhouetted but he's silhouetted in total white um you can see as he opens the blinds to look at new york um then to him to look out and obviously see the city there's no pyramids there are no flying jackals and then he kind of has a little tear come down and he smiles to himself there's a bit of closure there that it's almost as if uh, when I read it, you kind of think, okay, um, had he been, 
you know, had he been dreaming all this? I know it's very tropey, but had it all been a dream and, and had it been also symbolic of him um, uh, kind of making peace with these personalities that I, that he has? Um, that's how I took that ending. Yeah, um, well... Oh, sorry, just to interject. Yeah, I was um, yeah, I was very much the same. You know, it's it's not really the end because all that mm. crazy stuff happened, but it almost feels like a new door opening, like that this is the end of such a specific part, and we've sort of opened to a whole new part where New York is there, and yeah, we're not sure about all this crazy sand happens. Yeah. So, did you take it as well as um as as Mark, or now it's. It seems like Stephen is the dominant per- personality here because he wakes up as a Stephen, right? Um, uh, hang on, let me just double check. Uh, yes, she calls him Stephen. So yeah, <laughs> he wakes up. He wakes up as Stephen. But did you see it as um, him being exercised from Conchu? No, I think he's. No? Yeah, no, I think. Yeah, I, just the big reveal of him being such a villain. I think very much. I got the sense that uh, Conchu's. <laughs> He's a he's a he's sort of escaped from Conchu, but in sort of the next door over, you know, he's he's closed the door, but Conchu's there, banging to get in, breaking in, and ah. it'll sort of be Mark on the run now. I guess that makes sense as well, because he he ran away from Conchu, um, but you don't actually see Conchu dying or destroyed or anything like that. So he he has escaped him. Yeah, I, I definitely I can see your point. Uh, he has escaped him, but Conchu is still there somewhere, right? Yeah. It's... It's just such a crazy opening for what's to yeah. come next. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so that was yeah the, the first um, the first arc, which was uh, a fantastic a fantastic um, story by Jeff Lemire. Just I've got a, just a couple of little additional notes I wanted to to add in. Just you know little queries and goofs. I thought. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I thought at the beginning like. Why does Marlene go towards the classic Moon Knight, right? The, the Moon Knight, who we know now as Conchu, he's kind of taking a hand going, come follow me, don't don't listen to this guy, he's insane. D- did you wonder why she followed him? I thought she was gaining more clarity as they went to, towards yeah. the pyramid. It's almost uh, like she wasn't really there at all and just sort of this... Yeah, no, it was really strange and we never got any closure of that in this issue. It might have just been maybe an oversight or maybe just the fact that she she is just a, still a little confused and mm. and the f- and the fact that they're both moon knights i mean you know you got to you got to wonder so maybe that was it um the other one other notes i had were the space the space wolves or what i call the space werewolves because <laughs> you know we always associate werewolves with with moon knight um obviously from his origin uh and i'm just wondering this, I think, is their first appearance. Like, where did you have you come across them before, Connor? No, I think this is yeah. This is very much Lemire's opening of a whole new uh, little bit of a mystery for us to explore. I think. Hmm. Because there was a um, in volume one. I'm aware of Moon Knight. There was a, there was an issue where he lands on the moon, but that was um, based on uh, he was affected by some drugs, and yes. I think he was basically hallucinating. Mm, that was a good issue as well, but there were no werewolves there. But he was definitely on the moon, and he was fighting these moon kings. I think he was um, he was seeing them as. So I thought maybe that was a slight reference to that. These space werewolves were a slight reference to that. I don't know. It was very like, it was very weird and very cosmic. Um, the only other thing as well is that in Mark Spector towards the end of that run um, with uh, Seth Falcone um, or oh, Falcon, I think and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a whole cosmic thing with the Infinity War there to do with oh, Mark okay. as well. Yeah, so the, Mark has uh, Moon Knight has touched upon the cosmic before, but um, this is the first time I've seen space werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other notes I had was uh, we see what I found very striking was Marlene wearing a red cloak when when Mark becomes Stephen Grant. Did you did you um, pick up on that or? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't quite get what was going in there. I kind of assumed it was part of the, a uh, part of the set, but part of the set. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll put it down to maybe two things. I thought maybe there was a connection there. Um, I first thought that there might be some, some sinister connection there because we've we've seen red used oh, before. Oh, that's um, true. Mm, like in the issue before, uh, Conchu was in the toilet cubicles, and that was all red. And so red seems to be a theme. Um, and also at the end when Mark 
jumps from the pyramid obviously there's some blood there a bit of red I also thought as well it could be a, a like a reference to Red Riding Hood because again the wolves um, I, I don't know uh, I just thought that was that was a, a strange uh, costume that you'd be wearing mm. um, yeah and uh, oh yeah the other note I had was about Seth we actually we actually got to see Seth the first time um, and he got roundly beaten by Conchu, and he's just uh, he's left in the corner. And yeah, I think what I mentioned before was the questions of um, was it Seth who actually um, constructed that pyramid in New York and uh, and, and all those Egyptian um, kind of jackals and sand? Was it him and and Conchu taking over his work, or was it indeed Conchu who constructed it all? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, that was sort of the um, big tip-off to me that Conchu very much wasn't gone and, you know, there was still a big thing. I think the existence of this uh, other void, over void, and Mm -hmm. um, sort of, yeah, what it was and the fact that, you know, Seth was told to be the big bad, but he was chained and then we have no idea whether Conchu was working with Amut in that Mm -hmm. uh, mental hospital. and yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping we can see a bit more of, of Seth somewhere. He's, he does sound like an interesting character. He, he was kind of used in a really weird way in Mark Spector, Moon Knight. Um, oh, really need to read that one. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but nothing like, it, it's very 90s, but nothing like the Seth that you see in this issue here. So um, I'd like to see Seth like yeah. we see him here as well. I, I think that would be really cool just to get the Egyptian gods happening. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, yeah, so that was uh, yeah, that was issue five. Uh, we've r- that's been wrapped up, so we'll be starting the next one um, uh, next episode. But yes. uh, before we do that, Connor, we have a little something. Oh, we sorry, um, a bit of a rating. R- ratings, yes, of course. Uh, what what would you rate it? Oh, I mean, this issue was just hit after hit with the pacing, and you know, I think I was a bit more affected than you with the country reveal, so it was all sort of mm-hmm. blowing my mind. So. This is a definite six out of five. Ah, oh, awesome! Six out of five crescent crescent hearts. That's Lovely. The one. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I'd have to give it a solid five out of five crescent darts. I really did enjoy this. Um, despite what I said about uh, about the reveal of Conchu, I think that the art oh, really? makes makes up more more than makes up for it. It, it. it was a really really fun issue. It was a really good way to end the arc as well, because um, sometimes. Uh, sometimes writers have have problems finishing off um, stories. Mm-hmm. Um, they kind of um, kind of just flatten out, or or they um, yeah they go for too much. But this was great. Um, so yeah, a, a steady five out of five crescent darts for that. Oh yeah, well yeah no, just a just can't wait to dive into this next part. You know, we have so many questions and a whole new beginning. It may mm. seem so. Yeah. It'd be great, and I think that yeah, obviously the next one as well. It's built around uh, all those guest artists as well. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. So, I don't think Smallwood's even on the next arc. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, I don't think so. Oh, lovely. Well, I'm not lovely. I do like Smallwood, <laughs> <laughs> but lovely that there's uh, we got all that talent on that in that one book. Um, okay, so moving right along, before we actually go to our second review, we did promise to do a character spotlight. And uh, this leads really well into our second book review anyway. So, um, Connor, we were looking at Morpheus. Yes, the uh, the wonderful but kind of short run as we found villain. The, uh, mm. A very tragic villain as well. And and his, his history is very kind of sketchy. Um, look, before we go into that, uh, Connor, you've got a list of appearances. Yes, so yep. um, Morpheus first ab- um, debut. Debuted? Mm-hmm. Yeah, debuted. <laughs> yeah. Um, in Moon Knight Volume One, Issue Twelve, where actually a lot in this um, sort of first half, first twelve, fifteen volumes was very much sort of a mm-hmm. um, villain after villain. You know, just the hits keep coming. There was always some sort of almost like a monster of the week, sort of a slasher. <laughs> That's exactly what of, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The uh, werewolf. So this was this seemed like another one of the lineup of his. Uh, supernatural escapades mm-hmm. he, and um he had after that he would next make his appearance in the second half of the run that very much became more arc orientated in uh moon knight volume one issue 22 and 23 my favorite issues of that first uh. volume it's fantastic it uh, deals a lot with um all of mark's personalities and morpheus is a very 
very intense, very scary villain where um, Simkovich's art went to a whole new level of yeah. displaying the hallucinatory powers of him. Well, yeah, he kind of develops his powers in that, doesn't he, as well? Yeah. Mm. And, um, yeah, and from there he sort of took an another slumber. Mm -hmm. um, he appeared in the uh, official handbook of the Marvel Universe, which is like its encyclopedia, you know, no real story. Mm -hmm. yep. And then um, he appeared as a, another sort of one-issue villain in Fist of Conchu. Oh, oh, he yeah. did, did he? Okay. Yeah, in the, uh, in the third issue, he was the big bad of that issue. Oh, okay. It was just, you know, another another take a tumble, go go have a slumber, Mr. <laughs> Islandless Man. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And then uh, the real sort of surprise I found that I never knew about, he, he had a, um issue appearance in Doctor Strange Sorcerer Supreme Volume 1, Issue 18. Ooh, I'm going to have to have a little read of that. Um, that would be interesting, and it makes sense as well, because... One of Doctor Strange's villains, Nightmare, is all about about you know sleep and and um, oh, yeah. and nightmares within that. So it would kind of make sense that Morpheus is in there too, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't quite have a look at the issue, which we may even cover it on the show one day, maybe. Mm. But yeah, possibly they're the connective tissue. He might be. Okay. And then, oh yes, and then. Oh, yeah. The uh, sort of the biggest run he had was a part of, uh, as Ray was telling me, Resurrection War issues one to four. Which, if you'd like to give a little explanation. Oh, uh, look, uh, yeah, I have, haven't read it in a while, but um, I was just quickly having a look at issue four because I, I wanted to, to see a bit more Morpheus just before we went on air, and um, I was just reminded of the the gorgeous art in there. Uh, it was it's really good. It's um, basically oh, look, look in a, in a nutshell, um, uh, for some reason. Uh, all of Moon Knight's rogues galleries are kind of resurrected or, or brought together, and uh, by this kind of dark god, and they want, um, yeah, they obviously want one thing. They want to, they want to kill Moon Knight. So um, yeah, it was, a, it was a little fun uh, four-part romp, where uh, it's actually quite dark, um, and it was. It's written by Doug Monch, uh, and the pencilers uh, I've got here is Tommy Lee Edwards, and Ooh. I was met. Oh, do you know? Do you know him? Yeah, he's um he's pretty pro prolific with um incredible works. Oh, okay. Because I, I mentioned to you briefly just off air that I kind of got the sense that he was a like a bit like a Mike Mignola, like not yeah. It's if you put them side by side, they probably don't look like each other. But um, I well, don't know. Well, yeah, he I... actually um did issues of Hellboy. Actually, oh, did I just he? Found. Yeah, there you oh, go. Right. Okay, <laughs> reporting, lovely, good stuff, <laughs> kind of. Um, but yeah, uh, that's what I thought. It, it looks very, um, it's very Mignola esque. Uh, very beautiful art. The colours are great as well. Um, so definitely worth a read. Um, uh, I think one of the the loonies as well. Uh, oh no, that was for High Strangers. Yeah, no, that, don't scratch that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is anyway. This is definitely worth a read. Uh, it's a nice compact story. Um, and Moon Knight is, is looks kick assy. He's got red eyes. It's really cool. But um, yeah, Resurrection War. It's, so it's got all of them. It's got Black Spectre. Uh, it's got uh, Morpheus as well. Uh, I think it's even got Randall Spectre um, and Bushman. So it's got them all in there. So it, it's a bit of a fun fun one to read. Um, but yeah, and then finally, kind of you've got here. His uh, Morpheus appears in Fear itself. Fellowship yeah. of Fear number one. So like a tie into that big event that I haven't read. Mm, and yeah, he I, an issue, so he must have been pretty small. Yeah, just the one issue. Yeah, I, I haven't read it as well. Um, it's been on my list for a while, but you know how things always seem to <laughs> always seem to pop up in the way. So I'll get to it one day. But yeah, so he uh, so he appears in a fair few of them. I'm hoping Morpheus appears in more because he's a very interesting character. Um, as the the Marvel Universe uh, uh, guide goes, uh, Robert Markham was born in New York City, and he suffered in. Uh, a viral infection so he sought he went to see treatment um, to a doctor Peter Alrone uh, who happens to be Marlene's brother um, and Peter treated Robert with an untested drug but it, it you know as everything in the Marvel Universe with drugs and chemicals it didn't go well <laughs> <laughs> and it actually dis horribly disfigured Robert um, into this beast um, that we see as Morpheus and it actually deprived him of sleep so um, one thing it actually it gave him no no eyelids he's got these big bug eyes and i thought that was really funny but it, it actually makes sense because uh if you can't sleep um you know if you have eyelids 
you kind of can, but um, if you take the <laughs> eyelids, if you take the eyelids away, then you can't you can't sleep. So um, this drug changed him, it changed his physiology as well, uh, and he developed these um, psionic powers, uh, which is basically uh, ebon ebon energy. And and the other final little point was that he because um, he has a lack of sleep. Um, and because he can't, basically, his mind can't dream and can't kind of um, process all... You know how they say people dream and, and it's a way of kind of getting rid of the garbage um, yeah. and kind of and resetting? Since he can't do that, it kind of drive, drove him insane. So uh, that's what's happened to Morpheus. Um, and if we look at his powers, Connor, what, what, uh, how, how do we best describe his powers? Um, they're all, it's almost sort of this tangible like dark energy field it was created it was said that uh apparently humans have this psychic need for dreams that when that mm -hmm. doesn't happen you know we go insane that this untested drug formed them into a tangible black power that recharges whenever a night cycle happens that he doesn't sleep mm -hmm. so yes it's a uh, this physical dark energy of physical form imagine a field that as long as um Morpheus wills it can take any form. It can be an explosive blast. It can be a whip. It can, mm. yeah. It, it's very, uh, yeah. It's very um, multifunctional. I thought as well. <laughs> Maybe not not as clearly defined. But I do love the idea that Morpheus is basically kind of like a battery. So um, you know, the less, uh, the more, the longer he's awake, is that the longer his uh, ebon energy will build up, and then it comes to a point where he has to release it. And uh, he runs out of it as well. So we'll see in, in issue 12, he actually runs out of Ebon Energy and he has to kind of recharge. And I kind of like that. Um, I kind of like that constriction for Morpheus. Otherwise, he's a really powerful dude, right? If he has just that Ebon Energy, you know, yeah. on, on whim, then you know, he, he's pretty powerful. But yeah, he's, it, the Ebon Energy seems to be quite undefined because as you say... Um, we see it in issue 12, There's a, it can be seen as explosive or, or even just a concussive force, like kind of like uh, Cyclops's, um, uh, what do you call them? What, what, eye beams. <laughs> eye beams, yeah, his eye beams with the ruby quartz. Uh, they seem quite concussive, but then also as well, we see in the issue, um, it kind of like, if you zap by it, you, you kind of... I don't know, Mar, uh, Moon Knight described it as being very cold, um, so it kind of, I don't know, zaps you of <laughs> body heat or something. Um, yeah, I think it's almost like, you know, waking up in a cold sweat like that mm. you've lived through a nightmare by being hit by it. Ah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. That could be that could be it. Um, and also as well, he uses it almost like I, I likened it to Juggernaut. He has it almost like a force field around him. So you see the um, you know in some of the issues, he gets shot at by cops, and and uh, Moon Knight throws a truncheon at him, and it just bounces off. So he uses it in various ways. Uh, also as well, he uses it almost like webbing. Um, you saw that in issue twelve, Connor, how he kind of swings away. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so the open energy is a very, uh, very versatile um, uh, power that he has. Uh, so, yep, yeah, uh, Morpheus is is able to do that in later ep um, issues as well, Connor. He in uh, those issues twenty two, twenty three, mm. he actually develops something else, right? It's um, he can actually cast illusions in people's minds. Is that? Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a, almost like a scarecrow type. His mm. sort of fear poxons. You know, yeah. it's just except more controlled. You know, he can will inside the heads whatever, whatever is their deepest darkest fear that he can control. Um. So in those issues twenty two and twenty three, it was actually a uh, Mark's other personalities out to get him. Yeah. Right. So yeah, very similar to uh, Nightmare, I reckon. I think I think Nightmare does something similar to that. Okay, in, cool. Yeah, in the Doctor yeah, Strange um, corner like of the universe. Fake. Was that sorry? <laughs> Said Nightmare more like fake. He's a nothing but a big old <laughs> copycat. Oh <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so um, Morpheus is quite a powerful, um, quite quite a powerful being. Um, no, wait, Nightmare came first. Never mind. Sorry? I said Nightmare, Nightmare came first. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, actually, have we mentioned who created uh, Morpheus? Yes, that was um, um, Doug Monek and Dostoevich. Uh, okay. Oh, they, oh, okay, both of them. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, they must have copied then. Must have, <laughs> must have copied, <laughs> copied Nightmare. No, I, I like Morpheus. I think he's really good. Um, 
is a bit tragic. Like, he's a tragic figure, but um, he's also, you know, uh, mad <laughs> as well. Yeah. He's crazy. And, and, again, that's a running theme with a lot of Moon Knight's um, villains. They're, they're insane as well. So everyone seems to be insane. Um, yeah, so that's... Um, that's Morpheus. Uh, any other? He was named. Oh, he kind of self names himself, right? Um, so he kind of calls himself Morpheus, which is named after the the god of dreams in in Greek mythology. Yes. Um, and uh, what else have we got here? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. That that's just. Uh, and his death. So we're not too sure, right? In fear itself, if he actually. I thought I read somewhere that he died. Well, um, wasn't well. May, uh, did, does Resurrection do any of the villains in Resurrection War get like returned from the grave? Because he may have died in um, the Fist of Conchu. Uh, I mean, Sorcerer Supreme, Fist of Conchu, and then was resurrected in Resurrection War. As the, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I believe oh, I'll have to read it again, but I believe they were all kind of resurrected. Yeah, okay. so they were all killed or something. So yeah, he must have. He, yeah, he must have died at, um, either in Fist of Conchu, yeah, or, or Doctor Strange. So. Uh, loonies, if you can yeah. chase that up, or we will have a we'll chase that up as well and and see. But uh, definitely a very interesting character. Um, okay, Mr. Connor, we have uh -huh. a review two. All right, it's time for some uh, bare bones. Uh, this was um, issue twelve of volume one, the Nightmare of Morpheus, released on the first of October, nineteen eighty one, with writer um Doug. Doug. Oops. Doug. Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Doug I'm sure he's not. Oh, oh God. Um, Bill Sinkavich on art. Uh, mm -hmm. Joe Rosen letterer. C. Shield colorist. Um, Denny O'Neill editor. And Jim Shooter, who was the editor in chief um, in Marvel Times, where he ran out of Bird 2 Valiant. Yes. Big name in Valiant. Uh, so, our bare bones. Dr. Peter Alrain. Alrain? I have no, yeah, I think it's Alrain or Alrain, Al I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, Marlene's brother ponders over the guilt he bears for his patient, Robert Markham, who has gone horribly astray. Just as he decides to report Markham to the police over the phone as missing, an intruder breaks in and reveals himself to be Markham himself, now totally crazed and disfigured. With mysterious dark powers, powers Markham, calling himself Morpheus after the Greek god, assaults Alrain, but before he's able to finish the job, the police arrive and Morpheus flees into the night. Marlene hears news of her brother now in hospital and pleads to Grant to accompany her to see him. Peter slips in and out of consciousness, but sadly, as Marlene and Stephen arrive, arrive he falls into a coma. It is, long, it is not long during their visit that Morpheus returns to presumably finish what he started. And as he attacks the hospital, police guards, Moon Knight springs into action. Morpheus proves, however, too much for Moon Knight to handle, and he makes short work of Moon Knight using his versatile airborne energy. Airborne? Whatever. Mm -hmm. Moon Knight licks his wounds and returns to the scene of the crime, Alrain's office, to try and dig up information on Morpheus. He is greeted by Detective Flint, a, de a seasoned, wary detective, who rather than get in Moon Knight's way, assists him. Flint gives Moon Knight vital information, and the thankful White Knight leaves the office in search for Morpheus. Meanwhile, as Morpheus becomes more and more crazed, he decides to rob a bank, which is easily detected by Moon Knight. The two clash again. For a second time, Morpheus beats Moon Knight Ephesus. Moon Knight vows to do better and chases Morpheus into a zoo. And after an intense fight, where both seem to win at some point, except for the time there was a pamper, Moon Knight lures <laughs> Morpheus towards an electric generator. Feigning injury, Moon Knight tricks Morpheus to shoot energy at the generator, and as Moon Knight had hoped, the electricity negates Morpheus's airborne energy, rendering him powerless and at the mercy of the Fist of Conscience. Morpheus is arrested and brought to Seagate Prison, where he's sedated, effectively keeping Morpheus's airborne energy under wraps. Moon Knight forges a friendship with Detective Flint, and as the story ends, Peter Alrain wakes up from his coma, much to Marlene's delight. So, Ray, mm. thoughts? Mm. Thoughts, yeah. Um, this was a fun... This was a fun, yeah. like, uh, one-shot. As you mentioned, uh, uh, part and parcel of the uh, Monster of the Week. Um, so it was a nice, tight story. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, Morpheus is an intriguing, um, uh, sl yeah, and slightly crazed, um, mm. and, and you have to kind of wonder a bit of, at his actions. But, um, yeah, there was enough there to kind of keep you interested, and uh, it was great to see Moon Knight up against, uh, like, a powerful villain, I thought. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, probably my favourite part of this was uh, a very tragic villain. You know, he's mm. a very powerful, but uh, you sort of see at the very start he's always got this, you know, sad hidden tra- tragedy that is going more and more insane and beyond hope. Yeah, it's sad as well that um, maybe, well, maybe in the future to flesh out this Robert Markham, you know, uh, what was his uh, his viral infection or what was it that he was sick from? Yeah, I, it never said in the comics, so yeah. No, no. So, yeah, he's definitely a tragic, um, and, you know, to be horribly disfigured as well and, you know, you'd be mad too uh, if you had <laughs> treatment and uh, having that done to you and then... Uh, not being able to sleep and going mad. So, yeah, there's a lot of empathy for for Morpheus. Um, yeah, what what did you think? Uh, did you uh, uh, did you like the art? Yes, I, I, I love... Um, Sinkovich, um, in general, is a great artist, but uh, mm. I think, you know, not only is Moon Knight his shine, but uh, the crazy sort of look, which is where you can see where he was part creator of... Um, just how he looks in this very distinct creature of the night is just perfect for his art. He crafts it in such an incredible way that makes him probably one of the, my most memorable from this run, especially when I talked about issue 22 and 23. But yeah, mm. yeah, the the big bug eyes with almost the starry sky in yeah. his eyes. It's weird, isn't it? It kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, um, you know, generally you can kind of look a vill- look at a villain and you know, kind of sense where it's kind of come from uh, he's he's been uh, affected by this untested drug and all of a sudden he's got these bug eyes and he's got these like scales down his nose and around his eyebrows it's um yeah. a, a very strange uh, design but it is definitely memorable i think um and yeah the art oh we'll, we'll get into the art that's actually one of my aspects again um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, Sinkovich is uh, really, really good um, with his art. Very, He's starting to he's starting to really come into his own, I think, um, uh, with not only portraiture of, of uh, characters' faces, but um, just, just background stuff as well. Yeah, so um, would you like to start us off on your first aspect? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll... Uh, yeah, my first aspect is um, basically the introduction of Peter Alrain, uh, Marlene's brother. Uh, I think this is his first appearance as well, um, and he's got quite an important one because this story basically hinges on his actions. Uh, so he's the guy, uh, as we've mentioned before, who um, creates the creature Morpheus by accident. He's trying to help him, um, and he's trying to treat his patient. He's racked with guilt. I mean, the first couple of pages, he's wondering, oh, gosh, should I just report this to the police? He shows that he really cares for his patient. Um, but yeah, it was good to see uh, another, um, like another member of the Moon Knight family, so to speak. So he's kind of connected to Marlene being being her brother. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting. Sort of the the very shorthand sort of character building of being able to, you know, interestingly introduce, you know, he's someone who cares, and that you know he was willing to do something for his patient that he now feels incredible to look for because he's basically almost destroyed their life, mm. cursing them. It's a terrible thing to have on his conscience, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, without spoiling anything further on, um, you know, he, he does pop up again. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I thought he was important enough because, uh, obviously, uh, Marlene has a, has a connection to him. Um, and uh, I thought it was a good way to tie in Morpheus to, to Moon Knight. Mm, how, yeah. How about, how about your first aspect? My first aspect was... Um... The determination of the legendary Moon Knight, I think, uh, is a mm-hmm. particular favourite part I always love. That's uh, a bit later in the issue I'm starting with, where he has the mask ripped off. Yeah, I love that's that look as well. Such a favourite image, and just um, I love here just the fact you know he's beaten down basically three times mm-hmm. and still continues. And there was a question in the group by um, Austin, was it about a uh, uh-huh. Blade versus Moon Knight? And oh, yes. I think you brought up the fact that of just a. Uh, you know, Moon Knight will win against a even a more incredible opponent because his his just, just pure determination brings him to win the day. And I think it was just so great seeing Moon Knight to be beaten down and getting up. Yeah, uh, it's good. Such a powerful villain, and I think a very very much akin to Daredevil in the fact that you you see it's kind of um it's kind of uh, fleshed out in the Netflix series how Daredevil never gives up and how he was kind of brought up um, by his dad. Uh, Jack Murdoch, you know, to always, always 
stand up and you know the um uh, that recurring theme of him spitting blood while he's on the ground and, and kind of getting up i think that's very similar to to moon knight in the fact that um moonlight moon knight is kind of reckless as well uh uh, it's been mentioned uh, by Taskmaster that he'd rather um, take a take a hit than you know put up a defensive um, you know defend himself. So he's very much a reckless guy, but he'll never give up, and that's that's what I reckon is a really good point mm. with Moon Knight. And I, I love, yeah, I love the fact that he's up against this this villain, this disfigured monster who can literally you know if he wanted to could basically rip him apart, but <laughs> he just keeps on going back. Uh, to him time and time again and I think in the comic as well um, Marlene is saying oh you know it's all hopeless how can we ever beat this thing and and Moon Knight says something along the lines of what do you expect me to do hang up my cowl I'm not going to do do that so um, it's almost as if even when he doesn't want to he's compelled to just keep on trying so yeah I think that's a. I think that's really cool, and and I like exactly like you. I love that um that torn mask thing. It kind of reminds me of Spidey as well. Uh, you see sometimes oh, Spider Man yeah. with a a torn mask, and it, it kind of shows the doggedness of it. Um. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like that. Um, my next uh main aspect was I think we've covered this though uh, was Morpheus's powers, and I think um what this issue does it's a great. In- well, there's a lot of great introductions actually to this to this comic. Um, so you got Peter Alron, um, and you also have Morpheus, and it's a good uh, it's a good crash course in learning about Morpheus's powers. Um, so we discussed about the multifunctional use of his powers, but also how he kind of needs to charge up, and you see him in the comic as well. Basically, just just pacing up and down, waiting to <laughs> waiting for time to go by for him to actually charge up. Um, and uh, I like those constraints. Uh, I think uh, Monch and, and, and Shinkovich have done really well in creating um, a character that has constraints um, a- and has a cool power set. So, uh, yeah, I found the powers pretty cool. Um, uh, how about you? Uh, actually, I, I wonder, Connor, these yeah. Ebon Energy, you reckon it would be... I wonder if it's ever tied to the... Um, what is the other dark one? The Dark Force? Um, oh, you know, yeah. Hmm... Maybe not, but they look very similar visually, basically because they're black. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I just wonder if that's a connection with that somehow. Um, how about your next aspect? Connor? Yeah, well, I'll jump to my aspect, joining with you on uh, Morpheus. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I do love, I think, yeah, I just brought up the fact that Sinkovich had worked with um, Munch to create this character. It's such distinct visual language and, well, written language with him here. And I just love him as a character, and I love how tragic he is, and especially in this issue where we see him go more insane. I think my favourite part of him is displaying that insanity with how fast and frantic he talks. Like, you're right, he just paces back and forth, and mm. there's, like, 100 words per second when he talks about, you know, I need to build a palace. Yeah. There's yeah, no dream it... palace, I need money, and he just so frantically runs from thing to thing in an attempt to satiate revenge and build an empire. Yeah, definitely. Can, can you imagine how wired you would feel if you had never, yeah. like, if you had a lack of sleep? And, like, you would be crazy. Like, there have been, oh, been times when I was, uh, back when I was studying at uni, like, we'd do, like, all-nighters, and you do all-nighters, or maybe even go into the next day as well, and you start getting a bit, <laughs> you start getting <laughs> a bit, a bit loopy, and, uh, yeah, this is, this is very, very well, um, portrayed here by, by Morpheus. A, a lot of talking to himself, um, because they're not thought bubbles. I'm looking at it here, and he's just yeah. talk, talking out loud. <laughs> so, uh, he's definitely gone a bit loopy. But um, yeah, very very cool, very cool um, power set uh, with Morpheus. Um, yeah, that. Uh, well, if I go to my third aspect, um, well, my third aspect actually ties in with yours, Connor. It was um, it was how Moon Knight is really determined as well. Ooh, so I think nice. we've I think we've crossed um, crossed that. He he uh, he actually he calls it out in the comic as well. He um, strike one, strike two. He's he's easily beaten by Morpheus, and uh, he actually mentions, oh gosh, um, it looks like I might be facing strike three, um, but luckily enough, he he uh, manages to to beat him on that third go. Uh, yeah, just his uh, his unrelenting um, determination um, to try and to try and get him, and it it shows that he uses his wits as well. So he he learned from his first two mistakes, um, 
uh, and he decides to try and try and uh, outwit Morpheus, and that's when the generator comes in. Yeah, which was an interesting decision. <laughs> it was. It was a very strange one, wasn't it? Uh, um, it was. It was largely unexplained. It was a big gamble by Moon Knight, thinking that electricity would somehow react with the ebb and energy. So it was very uh, lucky, let's say, that it actually worked. Because, um, you know, the other option would be that Morpheus shoots the generator and it explodes, you know, killing them both. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it was very it was very lucky in that, in that regards. Um, yeah, have you got a, uh, a fourth aspect? Yeah, just while we're on the topic of um, powers, I'll go to uh, make special mention of Sinkovich's art and um, mm-hmm. with how he uses the um, ebb and energy. There's specifically on this third, uh, second page after we see the mug shots of um, post pre and post um, Morpheus oh, yes. Alrain, um There's a couple of panels I love where there's one of him stalk of. Um, Morpheus stalking through the night with all the lights and almost the sort of water type effect. Yes. He makes good use of um, glass shattering, which sort of becomes a motive with the way that ah. his black powers almost sort of shatter the night. Like, there's a ah. there's a lot of instances where he uses the, um, you know, the energy to mm-hmm. sort of break everything around it except for this, like, circle of black energy. And whenever you see, like, the coloured rain as a character is zapped by it. And there's just a, and just the visual design of Morpheus, you know, the yeah. it's terrifying. Whenever there's a proper face shot, it's just brilliant and incredibly detailed. Yeah, just just otherworldly, isn't it? And I want to touch actually on your comments on um, on the art. I actually had these in my additional notes as well. Ooh. What I think was really cool, uh, what Shinkovitz does, is not only with the portraiture as I mentioned, like you see close-up faces of Detective Flint and Peter Elrohn. Very kind of realistic looking faces, really cool. But what uh, Shinkovich does is that he creates this um, uh, uh, this tone to 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 the city that Moon Knight is in. It's, it's New York, but he's got he got guys drinking coffee with the you know the sm- the steam coming up. You got people smoking with the smoke kind of drifting into the air. Um, as you mentioned, um, the watercolory effect of the street lights. You have they're very simple effects, but you see them against the glass, and they just show um, mm. you know the reflection of of, of car headlights or, or traffic lights and stuff. So. Shinkovich really does, I think, create a nocturnal world to this. And I'm, I'm wondering if Bemis um, um, and Burroughs will take a leaf out of this because they mentioned that, you know, their comic looks like it's it's pretty much nighttime all the time. And, uh, yeah, um, this is what I get from um, Shinkovich's work here. It's really great. Um, uh, v- very cool. I, I do like the idea about the, the glass there as well, Connor. There's a lot of glass shattering. Um, and the Ebon Energy, the... the uh, the visuals for that is 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 cool as well. It's almost like mottled, um, you know. It's like someone's dabbed, uh, like art wise, like Bill Shinkovich has like dabbed around the black. Yeah, it, it's kind of got a um, not web like. It's uh, yeah, it, it's it's a very nice texture. But um, yeah, yeah, great stuff about the art. All right. Well, would you like to move on to your final aspect then, my friend? Yeah, my, my final aspect was um, basically, again, another introduction, and that of Detective Flint. Yeah, also um, my final aspect, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, he he's great. He, he's a good character that, that um, fortunately, he returns again and again, and he becomes kind of a regular um, police contact um, for, for Moon Knight. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, apart from how Shinkovich portrays him in the art, um, I love how he actually kind of resigns to the fact that yep yeah, we've got a vigilante look i'm not going to get yeah i'm not going to yeah. <laughs> get in your way i'm realistic i know that you're doing good so i'm going to help you but if anyone tells uh, asks you just tell them that you know you knock me out or something so <laughs> um i like that realism that he has um and uh yeah he, he just i don't know in, in this issue he has a is it seems quite likable already yeah that that was sort of my thing of being the absolute goat he is um his <laughs> You know, he's kind of witty and snarky, but he's very sort of world-weary and understands, you know, just how the world works. And, you know, this this kind of is how you think someone would relate to a vigilante of helping save the day against this impossible threat. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it gets too tropey about the police officer going, oh, vigilante, you know, we've got to bring you in. You know, I think that's been done to death. So it was good to see that, um, you know, although a lot of uh, heroes have police contacts, it was good to see that this one, like Flint, um, was a bit more amenable to, to Moon, Knight's, uh, Moon Knight's actions. So uh, an, an important introduction to the Marvel Universe and, uh, yeah, one that I hope that Bemis and Burroughs uh, will still use in their run as well. Yeah, for sure. Mm. A- any additional notes, uh, Connor? Um, not really. I just want to make special mention of the time that randomly Moon Knight fights a panther in the, uh, a park yeah. zoo. <laughs> How cool is that? Right. <laughs> what what a random thing to do! And he actually he uh, he beats it right. And yeah, uh, he just knocks it out, throws it in the way of his uh, Ebon of uh, Morpheus's Ebon energy. Mm. But like any animal lover, and I think Doug Monch probably is one. He makes sure he makes mention that. The panther will wake up again, like, yeah. un- unharmed in a few hours. So, so if in case anyone was worried that um, uh, that Morpheus kills or slays the panther, uh, uh, we can be assured that he isn't. Um, yeah, I thought the panther was funny. Um, it was good, uh, and it was just very random. Uh, I've just got a couple of things here. Apparently, I've read here somewhere, and I'll need verification. Um, I don't have the evidence with me. But I have heard that that first page showing the picture of, of Robert Markham, that is actually a portrait of Doug Munch. Oh, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe if you can have a, a little yeah, <laughs> a dig up there, Connor. Yeah, it totally Connor. is. It's the it similar mustache and the oh, facial okay. look. Oh, you just, you just um, Googled his yeah. actual face. Okay. Yeah, I, I've read it somewhere. I can't remember, but... Um, I found that pretty cool. Like again, one of those things that the artists um, kind of get their face face in there. Uh, also, as well, <laughs> uh, me with my OCD, a bit of typo errors here. Um, if we look at, uh, I think the first time Marlene um, runs to to Moon Knight, um, she she calls him Stephen, S T E V E N, uh, and then later on in the issue. The letterer, ooh, who's the letterer again? He um, he uh, spells Stephen uh, S T E P H E N. So Marlene yeah. calls him Stephen twice. A little bit of a a little bit of a goof there, <laughs> but I'm I'm sure we can. Uh, I'm gonna stick to uh, with a V. I reckon. I think I've seen that mostly. Yeah, it it does change quite often actually. I know. Mm. We've we've read a couple of um. You know the one-offs. I think in the Marvel preview, the first one we ever did, it was a uh, PH. Hmm. So they've got to. Someone's got to make a decision here. Someone, yeah. Someone's going to make an executive decision. Is he a V E N or a P H E N? But anyway, that's uh, just one of those little points. Um, also, uh, yeah, I had a. If we go back to, so again, that first appearance where Marlene um, rushes to to Mark or to Moon Knight. She dresses him, um, so bear with me here, Connor. Um, <laughs> so he jumps down from who knows where, probably the helicopter, and she runs to him, and she refers to him as Stephen, right? Um, and he says, uh, and if you yes, look at the panel yeah. below, he, he takes off his mask and goes, just give me time to change to Stephen Grant. Okay, now if we take the personalities as totally independent of each other, when she's running to him, isn't that Moon Knight? It's not Steven, right? Yeah, no, it, it was, it was, yeah, that was something very stark to me that almost seemed like Moon just forgot what he was setting up here. Hmm, so it's very complicated as to how these personalities interrelate to each other. Um, it seems that, like, whoever Mark Spector slash Steven slash Jake slash Moon Knight is, this entity has a grasp of all the personalities and uh, can kind of pick and choose, you know, and, and change quickly. But, yeah, it just seems that they're not totally separate as well. So yeah. it, it makes it quite a, quite a complex, um, complex personality, I guess. Um, and also, the last little additional note I had was, okay, again, bear with me, Connor. If you, uh-huh. cast, your, if you cast it to the last page... Um, and we have um, Morpheus sedated um, and in the psychiatric ward. Can you see that picture? <laughs> With the eyelids? Apparently. He's got he's got eyelids. He's, <laughs> not, he's not meant to have eyelids. That's the whole big thing, isn't it? So, <laughs> so 
I think this was like a little quick fix. Um, oh, look, Bill Shinkovich, he could have at least blindfolded him or something. Yeah. <laughs> He's not meant to have eyelids. So, so uh, I, I picked that one up as a, as a little goof. Um, there, look, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe he does have some sort of secondary eyelids, um, which aren't your typical eyelids. But he definitely looks asleep and happy there. So, <laughs> so uh yeah, so that was uh, that was my final note for that issue. Um, okay, rounding off that issue, issue twelve, Connor, Crescent Dart ratings. What do you give it? Oh, I think you know this is a very strong issue in a in a run of fantastic issues. You know, it's it's a mm-hmm. it's a nice little one shot that you know led to my favorite issues. Which, uh, but yeah, I think um, just for a little a little one and done, I think it's a definite uh, four out of five Crescent Darts. Oh, nice one, nice one. And how does that how does that uh, compare with those other um, classic issues that we did? Um, what, what did we do last time? We did the uh, oh god, I can't remember already. <laughs> <laughs> um, we kind of liked that last one, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, that was a. Uh... Oh my god, I can't believe I forgot. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot as well. <laughs> oh yeah, it was the um, Iron Man issue. Oh, they, of course, that was a good one. Um, yeah, yeah. And so you gave that one a. F- did you give that a four as well? Or? Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. It's very much the same. It's um, yeah. It's just a, it's a short and sweet one and done that just understands the characters it's writing about. You know, it has the advantage over that Iron Man issue for having re- a really a really great villain. But yeah, I think it's just a just in the right writer's hands, just pure understanding of the characters we have in front of us. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that was because I remember, I think I gave that one four crescent darts. I really did enjoy that Iron Man issue. Actually, I, I really did enjoy it. Um, so let me. I really did enjoy this one too. But I'll give it. Um, how about I'll give it three point seven five crescent, <laughs> crescent darts. I'll go into decimals um, because uh, I'm just too lenient on my marking. So <laughs> three point seven five. I think is still a, a highly respectable score. And um, uh, look, I'd give it four if I could. But just just to compare it with the Iron Man issue, um, uh, I'll give it just a little bit less. Um, I do like Morpheus uh, in it and the introduction of, of Detective Flint. It's got yes, all the exact. It's got all the bells and whistles that you want um, on a comic on a Moon Knight comic. You got Doug Monch and, and Shinkovich. Um, so uh, yeah, a very very solid issue. Mm, for sure. Yeah. So loonies, those were the two books. Um, covered for this episode uh, um, next week Connor we have uh, a big one happening yeah this is very exciting and uh, we will be doing uh, as we probably will the start of every arc mm-hmm. a uh, panel by panel review of Moon Knight uh, Lemire's Moon Knight issue 6 if you remember our first episode we did that with um, mm. issue one of the um, arcs we'll just be going panel by panel talking about how it sets up the arc everything it's sort of doing here yeah, and it uh, that was really fun to do. So I'm looking forward to actually doing that again. And we'll only be focusing on on that one issue, so it will give us a bit more um, room to breathe with a with a panel by panel analysis. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there's plenty to unpack on that issue, especially with the the new artists on board, um, which is really cool. Uh, we also had, uh, I mean, we've still got to um, discuss this with Connor as well. I've got here on the notes as well, Connor, another potential character spotlight. Um, yes. Not necessarily next week, but it could be next week. Um, we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, but this was a request from Adam um, from our Looney Bin on the chat. And he he um, he mentioned that Stained Glass Scarlet would be a good character to spotlight. Mm, for sure. One of my uh, faves. Everyone's yeah. faves, I think. I think, uh, yeah, definitely. She's she's uh, she's in a grey area, isn't she, of uh, hero and villain or vigilante. So she would be good to cover. So we'll... Uh, We'll keep you posted. Just um, keep an eye out on our um, on all our social media. What we do, uh, as always, um, we are contactable on <laughs> on, <laughs> on on email uh, moonlightpodcast at gmail dot com. Uh, we also are on Facebook, so we have uh, facebook dot com slash itk moonlight, which is our p- uh, Facebook page. We also have a Facebook group uh, into the night a moon Knight fan base that's facebook.com slash groups slash uh, uh, into the nights so yeah. with, with a k yep um, we're on Twitter at ITK moon Knight uh, we're also on Instagram and Tumblr um, just just search for ITK um, podcast or ITK moon Knight we, sh- we should be there um, and where can they hear us Connor 
They can find us on all good podcast catcher, because we love them all. Mm -hmm. You can find us on SoundCloud with our own uh, dedicated RSS feed, or you can find us on our blog, intothenightpodcast.wordpress.com, with all these links to everywhere we exist online. It's real nice. <laughs> exactly. And don't forget, our um, if, you, if you'd like to um, jump on our mailing list as well, uh, and we'll have Over the Moon to you, uh, which is usually published... Uh, every Tuesday night, Eastern Standard Time, and that will just give you a heads up on uh, what the upcoming podcast will be, um, ergo uh, what we just mentioned previously, which was uh, which was uh, the issue six of the new arc. So, uh, yeah, all exciting stuff. Yes. Alrighty. All right. Well, um, that's it from us. Um, we'll catch you next week, um, and I'll have to throw it to Connor again. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much for listening, uh, as always, and uh, may country protect the denizens of the night. Maybe. <laughs> might be incredibly evil. <laughs> Catch up. See ya. <laughs> Moon Knight and affiliated characters, stories and events are properties of Marvel Characters Incorporated. Materials used and discussed within the podcast are intended for critique and review purposes only under the fair dealing concept of the current Copyright Act. The views, information or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the copyright owners.